Good evening and welcome to our Camp Scott School virtual question and answer, live question and answer with myself, uh, Sam Jones. I'm the head teacher here uh, at Camp Scott, have been for the last two years, and that's absolutely my privilege uh, to be so. I hope the technology uh, stands up uh, this evening. This is very new for us. Uh, we're doing our best to, to give you um, as good an experience as we possibly can, um, given that we can't do things in the normal way. Um, I hope that you've had an opportunity to have a look at the videos that we've got up on our Padlet site. Um, my address uh, to families, to year six families and students, um, and also an opportunity to hear from each of our heads of department from each of the subjects, along with hearing from some of our um, students, our head boy and head girl, and a couple of our year seven students who are relatively uh, new on their journey uh, here with us. Um, now, all of those things we're, we're really hoping will answer um, a lot of the questions that you might have had, um, but this is an opportunity to, uh, to ask some additional questions, and we've had uh, quite a few questions in already from families that are hopefully tuning in, um, so I'll do my best to get through um, as many of those questions as possible. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to say that we are hoping to be able to offer some um, face to face meetings with myself, an opportunity to have a chat with me and ask any questions you might have in person um, that aren't addressed tonight. Um, and we think we've worked out a really clever way, um, a socially distant way, a COVID secure way uh, of enabling that to happen. And we're quite fortunate with our school site there. Um, and we believe we can do that uh, meeting and a, and a tour around our facilities completely outside of the school buildings, uh, which we believe will be the most uh, safe way to do that. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, um, hopefully that's clear um, on the videos and on the site anyway, then do get in contact, please, um, on our info at email address or on the school number uh, that you can find via the website. So do take us up on that opportunity. Uh, we'll do our best to accommodate as many of those as we possibly can. Um, now, all of the questions that um, we've received and we will receive during this uh, stream this evening will um, get the responses to those questions on a document that we'll share on our website uh, for those of you perhaps tuning in later or who are unable to, to make the stream tonight. Um, so do look out for that. Um, that's a chance for you to go back over those responses or share them with uh, parents that you know on the school gates and, and those sorts of things. Um, I know this has been, must have been a really, really unsettling time um, for you and, and, and most importantly, um, your sons and daughters, um, you know, having their year five interrupted in the way that it was, um, you know, in year six now, you know, not being able to come and visit schools in person. Uh, as I said at the start, I really hope that you get a good flavour of, of what we're like as a school. We, we love open evening. Um, the feedback we get from our open evenings from anybody who crosses the threshold of the school are always really, really um, positive. Um, and we're devastated that we can't do that in person um, with you all tonight. Um, but I know that it must be um, sort of unsettling um, for you. Um, but hopefully, you know, through the medium of technology this evening, uh, we're able to, to, to have a halfway house, I suppose, to try and deal with that if we can. Um, so get your questions in. There's no such thing um, as a daft question uh, this evening. So don't be shy, please, uh, on that Google Doc. Uh, please fire in any questions that you might have or any follow up questions to something that, that I say during this stream as well. And I'll do my best to answer as many as we can, probably in the next um, half an hour or so. Um, OK, without further ado, let's get cracking. So the first question from Heidi. Heidi, thank you very much indeed for your question. Um, what is your bullying policy? Now, um, you know, bullying is something that will happen in every school. Um, any school that says otherwise, um, I don't think is telling you the truth. Um, but we believe at Kelm Scott that everybody has got the right to be treated with dignity and respect. And we're a school, and we talk about this lots, that actively seeks and celebrates um, diversity. Ofsted actually, when they were here uh, last January, so less than a year ago, um, felt that this was something they couldn't pursue in school during the days that they were with, uh, here with us. Um, and they couldn't find any bullying for the, for the two days that they were here. And there was a lovely quote, actually, uh, from one of our students. And uh, it was the fact that students feel very safe. Um, and the Ofsted team said that leaders and staff work hard to minimise any risks uh, to students, both in and outside of school. And students told Ofsted, 
uh, that bullying isn't a problem um, at Kelm Scott. They just deal with any instance swiftly and very carefully. Um, and cyberbullying as well is something that is commented upon that um, you know we've had to deal with uh, very ably as well. I think it's really important that our very consistent ways of dealing with behaviour, which might come up in a question a little bit later on, are very helpful here. Um, our character development programme that I talked about in our speech, and that comes through the very robust pastoral system that we have. Um, and I think we take sort of all uh, negative behaviour very, very seriously. And there's a kind of spectrum, in a sense, from, from very mild um, to quite severe. And we tackle all of those, um, you know, very, very carefully. Um, encouraging empathy. I think that comes through through all of the staff that teach um, at Kelm Scott. Uh, mentoring for those students who um, both sides, actually the victim and the perpetrator uh, as well. Um, and a real keen focus these days. We've had to upskill ourselves in the last uh, number of years about the risks of cyberbullying. So that's that's something we take uh, really, really seriously as well. But I think if you've got an ethos at a school that is respectful, if you've got really positive, respectful staff student relationships, um, a kind and caring school that we are as well by the very nature of, of our school, um, our assembly programme that looks and addresses this uh, at all times. Um, and ultimately, as head teacher, I'm not prepared to put up with uh, that sort of behaviour and we'll put a lot of support in for those students who are bullying. Uh, but ultimately, there'll be very serious consequences for those who bully persistently. It's something that simply won't be stood for at Kelm Scott. OK, uh, to the next question. Let's hope the tech works uh, at this point. Um, okay, so a question from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. How do you intend to help children close any learning gaps? Um, and I'm guessing this is um, very much through a COVID lens and it's something that uh, we're living and breathing um, every day here at school at the moment. I think it's something that, that teachers are exceptionally skilled at, actually. And it's something that um, is always changing um, in terms of uh, students, sorry, teachers' perceptions of students um, lesson by lesson. So, you know, since lockdown, to be honest with you, but certainly since we've been back uh, in September, um, teachers are already working very hard to engage, uh, to identify those gaps um, in lessons. Uh, and also some really important conversations taking place in departments as well, led by heads of department. Um, and teaching is being adjusted accordingly because of that, uh, and actually schemes of work being um, adjusted accordingly. Um, and, you know, teachers are very skilled. There's a, lots of different ways that teachers assess that. Uh, and as I say, they're, they're very expert in, in doing that. Um, Google Classroom is something that we uh, began experimenting with. Again, something we had to upskill ourselves on very, very quickly during lockdown. But we're actually using it the other side of lockdown now to ably support individual students. I think it's that individualised uh, approach that's very important. Uh, but we're using Google Classroom, so tasks that individual students can be getting on with um, at home in their own time to stretch. Uh, themselves but also to close those gaps as well so we're using that very effectively too um, and we're confident certainly with uh, those younger down the school that those gaps will be um, you know shrinking and shrinking and hopefully completely disappearing by the time they reach the the upper years in school I hope that answers your question uh, Sarah um, right. How are children adapting to the new normal, um, as it was termed? I have to say, um, I'm immensely proud um, of this institution uh, since, um, you know, September in particular, in terms of our response uh, and all things bubbles. Um, it has been an exceptional response from staff. Um, it's been an exceptional response from uh, students as well. Um, and I said in my letter to families uh, just last Friday, that uh, to walk around this school as I do uh, every single day, um, you actually wouldn't notice that we were in the midst of a global pandemic, um, such as the, the kind of murmur, the positive murmur from the classrooms of students engaged in their learning, um, teachers excited um, and, um, you know, really engaged with, with their lessons that, uh, that they're teaching as well. Um, and students and staff have adapted really, really quickly to bubble playgrounds, bubble classrooms. Um, and it's going to be quite interesting for us, actually, on the other side of um, all of this. Uh, and there might well be some things that we keep. Um, and one of the things we've changed to uh, this year for, for our response to um, this new way of working is three longer lessons. We call them sessions now rather than lessons. 
And um, it's been really, so there are now three one and a half hour sessions each day as opposed to five one hour lessons that we, that we used to have. And teachers and students, and this is overwhelming feedback so far, are really enjoying this new way of learning. Their, their learning is a lot deeper as a result. The tasks that they can do um, in any given session uh, allows for that uh, that deeper learning. Uh, and students and staff are really enjoying that. So some of these approaches, some of the things that we've introduced just in response to, to keeping everyone safe uh, while still maintaining you know, a good education for everybody, actually we might keep on the other side of, uh, of this as well. Um, year 11 is coming a little bit later than everyone else and they're certainly enjoying that. So I think they'd be very keen to keep that too. But all of it will be up for discussion at the end of this year and, and we might well keep those things. But I think um, the one thing that, never fails to surprise me is the resilience of young people and the adaptability of young people as well. Um, and you know, they've adapted incredibly well to this new way of learning and actually, you know, taking each day as it comes still. Um, but uh, I'm really, really pleased with the response that students are coping very well. Uh, okay, to the next question. I didn't have a name for that last question. Apologies for not name checking you on that. Um, Next question was about my um, vision for the school, um, given all we've had to adapt to the new normal. I, I mean, the vision, you know, even you know, in the current uh, climate hasn't changed. And I hope that was clear um, through my address that hopefully you've seen on our Padlet page. So I won't go into too much detail here, um, but essentially what we're trying to do through our everyday um, experience at school, and that's uh, what we're doing in lessons, what we're doing outside of lessons, um, is to enable students to have the skills and dispositions they need um, to progress to the next stage of their lives, be that college. And actually, eventually, though, we want them to be able to compete um, incredibly well on the global stage. Um, so we've got quite lofty visions for that, and we describe ourselves as a highly aspirational school, and I think that fits very much into the vision. Uh, but we want to do all that whilst developing the whole person, and I think, you know, I'm definitely, um, and, and the staff too, and our ethos is about developing children holistically, um, so it's not just about um, getting outcomes, getting GCCs, we want confident resilient uh, young people who are able to you know speak confidently um, to large groups of people who are able to um, you know deal with difficult situations in their lives to be able to think independently um, so lots that we do is, is supporting them to be able to do those things but I hope you can get lots of that in terms of vision I try to concentrate on that lots in, in my address so do please refer to that if you haven't already Okay, next question. Uh, what is your plan to increase enrichment activities and when will arts and sports clubs restart? Um, tricky question to answer, actually. I can come back to, um, to taking each day as it comes, and that's what we have to do at the moment. Um, we had planned to um, begin our enrichment um, opportunities in October, actually. We thought we'd give ourselves um, a few weeks to, to get up and at it and allow people to adjust to the new ways of working. And we hope to get back to clubs at that point. Um, but then, of course, um, infection rates increased uh, in London and nationally um, and we had to change our approach to that and strip things back and we, we come back to three priorities really as a school at the moment um, the first one is keeping everyone safe and, and that's always number one priority um, second one delivering outstanding lessons and the third one you know working on our plan internally just in case there is a, a um, another lockdown um, so we've had to hold back on those clubs for the time being. What we are doing, though, and what we're exploring at the moment is how we can offer um, that co-curricular, uh, as we call it. So it's not extracurricular, it's co-curricular because it you know, sits right there alongside uh, what we're doing in lessons and in classrooms. But are there any... Um, virtual opportunities, online opportunities for our students uh, to experience. So we're working very hard and heads of the department are giving some real careful thought to that at the moment, um, as we feel like we might be here for a few months yet. Um, I think, you know, there's certain things, for example, like our, our classics program, um, and we really didn't want our current year nine to be a year group that missed out on our classics program uh, and not have the opportunity to take that up at GCSE when they do their options in March. Um, so that is something that we're um, offering and that begins, I believe, next week um, for a, a small group of, of year nine students so that they can maintain their classics program. I think it is worth saying to the audience tonight, to year six families, that we do, you know, are confident um, that, that come September 2021, um, we will be in a position where we can be up and running as a school in terms of what we always offer in terms of enrichment. And it's a huge programme. We have um, a year seven fair, a bit like a freshers fair at university, uh, if you will, down in the school hall. Um, dozens and dozens of clubs and teachers 
and members of staff who run that club kind of you know selling their wares if you like and, and um, introducing what they do and students then sign up to, to those clubs a bit like societies at university as well and you know it, it's every single you know club from debating to drama to music to sport to um, to the classics, as I've mentioned before, and, and to poetry, e everything in between um, that students can sign up for. And we're really confident they'll be back um, to that sort of normal way of working. Um, and I think with that as well, you know, the trips um, that um, are going out of Kelmscott every single day, we, we, we feel that's really, really important. And when you think back to your own school days, um, you know, lots of your memories are of those, uh, those day trips, those overnight trips, those residentials as well. Um, and there are students going out of Kelmscott you know, when we're in a normal way of working every single day, every single week, and we'll be, you know, looking to get those up and running as soon as we possibly um, can as well. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Um, okay, let's get to the next one. Um, so what emotional support is on offer for, for children here at Kelmscott? And I think, you know, I hope we come back to, to our ethos there. I, I come back to um, Kelmscott as a very inclusive school. And I think we're developing a really um, excellent reputation in the local authority now for our inclusive approach. It's something that's been recognised by the local authority on, on many occasions now. And I think it comes back to that holistic development I talked about. Um, and that wraparound care and we see ourselves actually as a very therapeutic um, school. Um, you know, it starts with the pastoral system. It starts with your son or daughter's form tutor. Um, and the form tutor and head of year will work with uh, your sons and daughters from the you know very day they begin, um, even actually at the year six taster day, which is normally uh, in June time. And they will stay working uh, with those students all the way through uh, from year seven, right the way through to year 11. Um, and, and that actually you know, provides an awful lot of emotional support um, for those uh, students, which is fantastic. Um, and I think the consistent way that we structure everything in school in terms of how we deal with our behaviour that hopefully I'll come to um, later on um, actually creates the, the right conditions, um, the right boundaries so people feel emotionally safe uh, in school as well because they know that um, behaviour is tackled, uh, both positive behaviour I should say and negative behaviour is, is tackled consistently um, by all members of staff, you know, teaching and support staff as well. Uh, we have um, our own um, school nurse, um, who's just a brilliant member of staff, uh, who, who does so much in, uh, for, for so many students. We have our own school counsellor. Um, we have learning mentors. We have um, lots of external agencies uh, that we work with as well. Uh, we work very, very closely with the families, involve families at all stages with that, communicate with them, communicate with those external agencies as well. Um, and often again, um, you know, commented that parents and carers were highly positive about the support that their children receive. And it's, you know, something that is really, really important to us. It's not just about those academics. Um, we know that if we've got safe, happy uh, students at school, they will always go on um, to, to great things. Uh, so that's something we spend an awful lot of time supporting um, and developing. Um, you know, and that goes right down to, you know, members of SLT being outside on the gates. For those of you at the local feeder primaries, you'll see us out there in our purple tabards every morning, every afternoon, walking up and down Mark House Road into the chicken shops, uh, making sure that students get home safe. And I think all of that engenders um, a really emotionally supportive and supportive in general um, environment for our students. Uh, thank you for your question, Laura. Um, okay, so um, I touched upon that a little bit. And the next question, uh, how do we foster inclusion and reduce bullying and exclusion? Hopefully we've addressed uh, reducing bullying. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, exclusion in a few moments. Uh, and again, just to come back to in inclusion, it's um, you know that fair chance for everybody to learn, everybody to develop, but actually with inclusion, we want everybody to thrive. Um, and everything that we do, um, you know, is to ensure that everyone has the opportunities, but we really try and make sure that everybody thrives there as well. Uh, in the same classrooms, and, and that's our SEND students, um, our special needs students, and our EAL students, English and our langu uh, language students as well. Um, it comes back, I think, for me to, to valuing the unique contribution that every single student in this school um, contributes. Um, and that's celebrating um, diversity um, that we often come back to as a piece of language as well um, here at Kelm Scott. Uh, and we learn together um, side by side. Discrimination is tackled um, right there at the root um, from homophobia 
to any sort of racial issues and um, really proud so far actually with our response to the Black Lives Matter um, movement. Um, and families can have a look actually at my assembly if they wanted to, which I think is on the same YouTube channel that went up last week to uh, see how I introduced that as head teacher as well. So uh, do please have um, a little bit of a look at that. Um, so hopefully all those things help us to become um, that inclusive school um, that, uh, that I talk about. In terms of how we reduce um, exclusion, um, you know, it's really, really important and actually very, very proud in my um, first year as head teacher that our fixed term exclusions um, went down an awful lot. Um, and actually, you know, just to quote a stat in the first term, I think, uh, make sure I get the numbers right, but it was um, a, a dramatic reduction last year in fixed term exclusions for us as a school. Um, and that's really, really um, important uh, to me. Um, coming back to that uh, inclusion question. So we've actually got, um, in terms of support that I mentioned, from the learning mentors and those sorts of things, but also an inclusion centre here um, at school. And, you know, if students, if there is a serious incident in school um, and that uh, needs to be dealt with and tackled, uh, we do that internally. Uh, so students might be taken out of um, their learning for a day um, and they get some intensive uh, support during that day, some restorative justice uh, work, conversations with a member of staff perhaps who they have issues with, um, conversations with the student if there's been uh, an issue between the students as well. But we do all that internally. Um, students get to continue their, um, their school work during that time as well and it, it's far more effective. Um, students don't miss out on their learning but also we can deal with and tackle those issues that might be and that really helps us to tackle exclusion. Having said that, um, I, I'm not afraid of exclusion either. You know, for students, I've got very high expectations, very clear expectations. I spent much of last year um, talking very directly to students about that in assembly and saying, look, you know, this sort of behaviour is going to result in this. Um, and I'm not afraid to make those uh, difficult um, decisions if I have to. Um, and often, you know, with those difficult decisions, it comes down to the safety of, of, of our site. Uh, and I've said a few times this evening that the first priority and it will always will be the first priority is making sure that the school community is safe. Um, so I'm happy to make those difficult decisions if I have to. Uh, but hopefully we can try and avoid them, uh, prevent them if we can. I hope that answers uh, your question. Um, OK, coming down to the next one. And we've touched upon quite a bit of this already. How do you prepare teachers for dealing with misbehaving, disrupting students? I, I describe uh, behaviour at Cam Scott as impeccable now. And I know that's quite a big word that's, you know, to, to use there. Um, but, but frankly, it is. Um, and any uh, external visitors who, who come round school are always, always, without fail, comment on the calm, purposeful atmosphere um, in the corridors. Um, and sometimes it comes as a surprise to them. It comes to no surprise to me as every single day when I walk the corridors, as I do religiously, um, it's calm, it's purposeful. So um, that was kind of my big thing last year, actually, I suppose, as, as the new head teacher then uh, was introducing our ladders. I was trying to see if I've got the ladders here. I'll hold them up. Um, not going to see the detail on it, but um, but all um, staff work to these ladders and students are aware of these as well. And we've got one um, ladder for our negative behaviour, which we call our consequences ladder, and we've got our rewards ladder as well. And I think... Um, and back to ethos, it's important that you know that actually when people talk about behaviour, the, the, the most important thing is to celebrate good behaviour. Um, and our students are, are fantastic um, young people and, you know, 99% of them are behaving exceptionally well, are ambitious, motivated, aspirational. And it's important that we reward them for that. Um, and, and that has to be the first thing we do because that um, helps to develop um, you know, the character, that holistic development that, uh, that I've talked about. Um, but the consequences are there to make sure there's a consistent approach to, um, to how we tackle that behaviour too. All staff get lots of training uh, in that. We revisited that in September this year, particularly with new staff to make sure that everybody's up to speed. Um, and we've got you know, very robust kind of sanctions in place um, from the exclusions that we've talked about um, to a head teacher's detention, which is on Saturday morning that I run um, from nine o'clock till 11 o'clock with full school uniform, uh, which you can imagine um, students are delighted to be there for that. 
um, but they carry on with their work for two hours and, and, and flip a negative situation to a positive one in terms of um, being able to get on with with some of their schoolwork um, down to head of year detentions, head of department detentions, teacher detentions. But it's important that individual teachers all own the behaviour, and that's what the ladders have allowed people to do, allow teachers to, to own it and be confident with that. Um, I'm really pleased with how our two non-negotiables have worked, and I talked about that in the speech, but the first non-negotiable... Um, is refusing to follow a teacher's instructions and the second is answering a teacher back and students are issued with a first warning a final warning and if they don't heed those warnings then they are taken to the um, internal exclusion or inclusion centre um, that I talked about a few moments ago but actually if you consider those two non-negotiables refusing to follow instructions and answering teachers back it, it stops everything at the root um, and it really has kind of um, just just improved behaviour no end and really empowered teachers um, some of the best compliments last year from from, uh, from some of the students were, sir, you've given teachers too much power. Well, actually, we hadn't. We'd just given power back to the teachers to, to tackle those um, you know, low-level incidents, but to make sure it doesn't escalate to, to the high um, incidents. And for me, my, um, you know, one of my, you know, main priorities is trying to create here the perfect conditions for learning, the perfect conditions for teachers to be able to teach um, with all the engaging activities that they want to do, but the perfect conditions as well for your sons and your daughters to learn without any dis disruptions there. Um, and another thing we tackled um, last year was, was what we call disruption-free learning. So lessons being interrupted with, sir, miss, I haven't got pen, I haven't got this, I haven't got that. So at the start of every single day, all of our students um, have those, uh, those uh, disruption-free learning checks every morning in registration. It's the first thing everyone does. Members of SLT go to each classroom to check that those um, those checks have happened and to make sure all is OK. Um, teachers all have their disruption free learning boxes and equipment is given out at that point. There's a sanction if a student you know, um, isn't bringing the right equipment um, persistently. Um, but then everyone gets the lessons and they can concentrate on the, you know, the important stuff at hand which is really engaging in that learning. And it's working really, really well. And I am just... Um, you know, absolutely every single minute of every day doing my best to, to make sure we create those optimum conditions. So I'm really, really proud um, of that. Um, you know, coming back to the uh, uh, the rewards for sanctions, we, I'm not sure if I mentioned at the start, but we have a five to one ratio that we try and include. So it's five rewards for every sanction we have. Um, every Tuesday at staff briefing, I go through the data from the previous set um, uh, previous week's data I should say and I examine that ratio for each year group for the whole school um, and if there's a year group perhaps that hasn't quite got the ratio right for the previous week we look for those opportunities to reward um, and that's kind of part of our everyday discourse really our, our, our weekly discussion about you know making sure that stays very very high priority as well and I, I, I can't uh, say it enough times I have got the highest expectations for the young people um, at this school and I know they can live up to those expectations and that's why they're sky high um, but every moment that they um, you know let themselves down I suppose and, and let us down um, it's dealt with but dealt with in a positive way but dealt with in a firm way and I think um, as I talked about um, I believe on the speech you know tough love again is something that we come back to um, often so I you know really hope you can speak to um families of, of uh, you know, current parents of, of students at school and you know I'm really confident that you'll get some some great feedback from them uh, about the things that I've just spoken about. Okay next question Christina thank you very much for that um, how do you ensure the correct level of challenge and support in your mixed ability classes? Um, I think it's an important question uh, hopefully we've uh, addressed that in some of the speeches um, now definitely there's a philosophy around um, mixed ability teaching versus um, set teaching but as well as the philosophy there also has to be some evidence driven and research driven results on that um, and I've always been somebody who's um, passionately believed in, in mixed ability teaching but actually um, the most recent research um, you know, it's borne out that actually you know the best outcomes are, are also from, from mixed ability teaching and the easy way to put that is um, that all teachers at Kelm Scott will, will pitch their their lessons to the very highest student and beyond in that class and then they will work out the ways that they can support the rest of the class to be able to access that 
Um, so that's the starting point, um, really. And if you have that in your in your mind, you can't go too far wrong. Um, but there's an awful lot of research that um, you know that suggests that uh, you know for all students actually, apart from a very very small percentage right at the top, that um, set um, teaching so um, stream to ability actually does an awful lot of damage in terms of stigmatising and those sorts of things. Um, but you know, every single year in every single subject, we have um, you know great volume of students achieving those high grades. And it's something that we um, analyze. It's something we track. Uh, we talk about seven to nines with the new GCSE grades um, and making sure we, we know the starting point of every single student at our school and we know where they should be ending up in terms of progress. Um, and we track that carefully to make sure that, that all students actually, um, but, uh, but thinking about our seven to nines as well, that they're able to get those top, top grades. Uh, and we're very confident our accessibility teaching um, allows uh, students to do that. Um, there's some quite interesting research for those interested by the Education Endowment Foundation, um, a, a really useful um, research group. Um, and we uh, do an awful lot of um work um, I suppose with the stats that we get from from them um, and they did uh, some very recent uh, studies a couple of years ago on accessibility teaching and, and again you know the best grades the best results for all students right across the spectrum are from accessibility teaching uh, but I'd welcome a chat with you a, a, about that in person I welcome an opportunity to come back at me with some some counter arguments it's always a very interesting debate um, but um, you know we're very confident in terms of the, uh, the challenge that we provide students in our, our school and there's lots on offer for our higher ability students to, to stretch and challenge them. Okay, um, next question. How are we doing for time? Okay, we're half an hour in already. That's raced by. Um, I hope you're not too bored. Um, I know you're sticking with me. Um, right, what's help is available for children with learning difficulties and special educational needs. Um, you know, really, really important um, that, that SEMP is tackled. We, again, have got a really growing reputation uh, for managing special needs students. Um, exceptionally well. Our SEND department is growing, um, you know, grew hugely last year. Um, we've currently got um, in year seven, uh, nine students with an EHC plan, um, students, uh, families who are, who are really, really impressed this time last year with the uh, facilities we've got for our SEND uh, families. They are um, right um, in the centre of our school in terms of, uh, of their provision, in terms of their resources, their classrooms, their support rooms. Um, and we really prioritise them um, in the school. Um, it's a graduated approach to, to tackling SEND, assess, plan, do and review, and that's something we're always doing. It's a continuous programme, um, looking at individual students to make sure that we're, we're meeting those needs. Sometimes, if necessary, there's that assessment for an EHC plan to put some additional um, support in place. Um, that emotional support, social support, physical disabilities. We've got uh, students in wheelchairs uh, at school. We've had students with Down syndrome and all are most welcome going back to my uh, inclusion response uh, a short while ago. Um, but we've also got things like our Reading for Success program, um, social skills groups. So we've got speech and language groups. We've got uh, TA supporting class, which we're you know uh, managing even even now. Um, we've got our compass room down in, in the SEND room, um, where students can come and reposition themselves. Uh, hence the name. Hopefully you can you can get that metaphor. Um, and again, coming back to um, our school counsellor, coming back to our nurse, coming back to the wraparound care, the outside agencies as well. Um, we love the fact that we're an inclusive school. We're passionate about it um, and it's something that we'll shout from the rooftops about. Um, normally with SEND families, for those of you on the stream, you might have particular questions uh, that are individual to your child. Um, I'd really encourage you to reach out on the info at email and on the school number if you'd like to organise an individual meeting with me and a tour around so you can ask those questions um, in person. Um, and I really look forward to, to, to seeing you and meeting you. I hope that answers your question. Um, that was Heidi and Jess, two people uh, asking that question about SCND. Um, okay. All right. And, and there's one particular question there from, from Melissa uh, about dyslexia. And we have you know lots of screening for, for dyslexia, um, English and literary support, uh, which is huge across the school, not just down in, in the SCND department. Um, physical resources, things like overlays uh, for reading. Um, you know, teachers are, are trained every year. Our new teachers are trained on how to support students in the classroom and in the everyday classrooms to be able to deal with that. Um, but still really high expectations for those students regardless, but they're supported to, to make sure they can access that work um, and it's kind of working on and celebrating what we can do rather than what we can't do 
Uh, but Melissa, I'll be more than happy to take any um, follow-up questions that, that you might have about your son or daughter. Okay, uh, students who don't um, speak English, this is, um, you know, in, in, in our kind of transient borough that we have here in Waltham Forest and um, the, the wonderful array of, of communities and um, different languages that are spoken at Kelm School, which at last count, I think, is 52. I'm just going to point to my Kelm Scott School heritage map behind me here, uh, where pre-COVID I invited um, students up to my office at break times and lunch times to stick a pin in the map uh, for the country where where their uh, heritage is um, and you probably can't see on the on the shot but there are pins just all over that map across the world and it's wonderful having those conversations um, with those students about where they're from and they speak with real pride um, but it's important for us as a school that, that we help them with their language and, and actually our results for our EAL students are absolutely outstanding year after year um, and once our students um, uh, adapt and, and acquire that language, uh, they go on to, to great things um, in terms of their GCSE outcomes. They're some of our highest achieving students and some of the students who make the most progress as well. Um, we have EAL buddies, so our English is another language buddies. Um, they've got lanyards on, which has got the flag of the, of the country, the language that they speak, so somebody who's more confident in speaking um, English and the uh, the home language, uh, for, you know, the mother tongue uh, for that student as well. So they're in different year groups all around school, so somebody can turn to somebody if there's a problem. Um, EAL uh, work packs of lessons to support students uh, to pick up the foundation uh, language they need, uh, timetabled intensive support um, as well, um, but also immersion too, um, you know, still um, as the research is, is found to be very effective. So students will be in those lessons and it's amazing how much they pick up through that uh, immersion. All staff are fully trained um, on that um, and we differentiate, um, so modify all of the learning tasks uh, according to those home languages. We're doing our best to, to get our website up and running we're not quite there with that yet given everything with covid it's a, um, a priority that's, that's slipped down sadly but we're trying to make sure that it's accessible for families as well so that we can engage families because i think there is a knock-on um issue here in terms of making sure that family is the best place to support their sons and daughters and make sure they can access the language so there's something around families and how we support them too that uh, that we're trying to develop uh, and finally there's an EAL um, section in our school library as well so a, you know a section of dictionaries but also um, books and those sorts of things too but they do incredibly well I mean it's um, as I talked about um, you know uh, Giannina our head girl from last year she arrived um, in year eight with uh, with zero English, I, I taught her in year eight, taught her French in year eight, um, and by year 11, you know, knocking it out of the park and um, you know, ending up this summer with nines and eights and sevens and top grades. I mean, you know, really, really inspiring stuff, actually, my students, they inspire us. Um, so, you know, definitely nothing to be concerned about there. Okay, next question uh, from Suzanne. So if you identify slipping standards in a student, how do you respond to that? Um, I've touched upon that a little bit um, already, but it's us understanding every single student on an individual basis. What is their starting point? And lots of that comes from um, the data that they arrive uh, from primary school with. Um, so the 100 score, uh, we do uh, some testing ourselves in the first few weeks of school as well, CATS testing, for those of you familiar with, uh, with that acronym. Um, so, you know, English, maths, uh, nonverbal um, skills as well. And that allows us to benchmark and allows us to know where every single individual student is. Uh, and we then have assessment points um, throughout their five years with us. Um, and we know where they should be. Each individual student should be at those milestones. Um, and, you know, ultimately the student um, isn't where they need to be. Then, you know, that conversation we had with the student, that conversation will, will happen with the families as well. Um, it might be an individual subject, it might be across the subject, um, but that's something that's tackled sort of individually. So reporting cycle as well. So we'll we'll meet with families in terms of that traditional parents evening. It's great to, to welcome people. Um, it, it, I mean, interesting, we just had our tutor parent day this week on Monday, which we put in deliberately at the start of the year to try and um, give families an opportunity to come in and find out how their sons and daughters have done in the first month post lockdown. Uh, we weren't able to do that in person, sadly, on Monday, but we did have telephone uh, meetings with families. And I did... Um, a dozen or so of those myself uh, with some year seven students actually was a real privilege for me to have those conversations with with year seven families um, but that's an opportunity to uh, to address when students are falling short of those milestones parents eating as well 
Um, so you've got two opportunities there to, to meet the nurses' families. And then there's a third opportunity, which is a, a written report that goes um, home to families. At Key Stage 3, we comment on learning attributes. So we comment on, for example, things like um, a student's organisation, because sometimes that can be the thing that impedes them. Um, sometimes it can be their contribution in class and um, they're not contributing as much as they should be in class. And we tackle those as a scale there. And we tackle those things. And if there are a group of students, for example, who are struggling with organisation, then the head of year or the form tutor, a member of the senior team, might do some work with that small group of students. If there's a group of students in every single department, um, particularly as you move up at school, um, there might be an issue with a group of students who are struggling to move from a grade four to a grade five or a grade seven to a grade eight. And there are targeted um, interventions in place uh, for those students to help them you know, get from that stage to the next and what unlocks it. Um, there's some really exciting online stuff now. Um, we're part of Hegarty Maths. Um, for, for anybody with a maths background there, it's a brilliant online package um, that our students are using and that helps people to, to bridge those gaps as well um, you know and that's something that um, that, that, that you know, we're looking as a leadership team I'm looking uh, as the head teacher you know forensically at each individual student to find out where they are where they should be um, and for me it's all about progress for every single student I don't look into someone when exam results come in at, at necessarily at those those high attainers although there are many um, I look to see the students that made the most progress. We want every single student, regardless of their ability, to make progress from their starting point to the, the end of their journey at the end of year 11 for us. And we know that attainment will take care of itself if we're taking care of everybody's individual progress that they made. So um, I hope that, that answers your question, Suzanne. Thank you for that. Um, Okay, I've got a question here about um, mobile phones. Uh, we, we banned mobile phones this year, um, so from September, um, and uh, there was a question about that. Uh, we consulted with uh, all of our stakeholders here, students, staff, and parents. Um, actually, you know, it, it's, again, something that the students have taken in their stride. Are they happy about it? No. Um, are we happy about it? Am I happy about it? Said teacher, yes, I am. Um, it used to upset me, if I'm honest, uh, last year to come out at break times and lunch times and see a group of friends, um, you know, kind of huddled around together, but, but looking at their phones and, and possibly WhatsApping each other, you know, to the person next to them. We don't want that. We want, you know, spoken word, conversation, people to be engaging, interacting with them, because those are skills that are going to be really important um, later in life. And they can get their computing skills and their tech skills through our computing lessons at school. Um, but also coming back to the to the bullying question um, from earlier on about cyberbullying, it increases the chances that it stresses children and students out, actually. Um, and actually, you know, lots of the feedback, although it's been done quietly, they perhaps might not be prepared to have their voices on record saying it. But I've had lots of thank yous. Um, thank you, Mr. Jones, for taking that away. We feel safer as a result at school. We feel less anxious in school as a result. Um, and it's been a really um, positive thing so far. Again, I'm more than happy to have a discussion with, with somebody about that. We're well aware that technology um, is a really important part of uh, of our society and you've got to have those tech skills but we'll provide and enable those skills in a different way uh, we want to make sure that our, our, our students are safe they're not anxious and you know they're um, communicating in, in in the old-fashioned way in a sense so i hope that answers your question abraham um, thank you for that um should be said actually that, that phones are at the discretion of teachers and, and sometimes there are some great teaching and learning opportunities in the classroom things like kahoot um, Google Classroom, as I've mentioned before. So at the teacher's discretion, sometimes phones will be used in the classroom, but you know it's very much at the teacher's discretion, which which works an awful lot better. Okay, uh, how do you keep parents connected and engaged? Um, really, really important. I think it's uh, something we've, um, you know, in the last 14 months in particular, we've improved an awful lot at. Um, you know, we want, we, we know that in primary school in particular, there's there's, there's that regular um, communication. Um, sometimes it's, you know, done informally uh, at the school gates, but, but really important communications. And we want to make sure that continues um, into secondary school as well. Um, I, mean, I do my very best as head teacher to communicate regularly with families. I have um, kind of pre-COVID, I was doing a, um, a fortnightly um, not sure, blog over exit, but uh, fortnightly communication with with families, kind of uh, summarising the highlights of some of my thoughts uh, about how the previous fortnight had been. Um, since COVID, it's been a weekly um, letter to me, to families, because um, I think it's really important that families are updated. So I do my best as head teacher um, to do that. Um, 
So, so I think um, you know we're working hard this year to improve our website. We spent some time over lockdown uh, redesigning that. We haven't launched that yet. It's still the old uh, format. I think um, I want that to be improved. Um, our school Twitter account as well um, will give you a flavour um, as to what we're about at school. But actually, a, a big step forward for us last year was something called Parent App. Um, My Ed um, is the is the app's name, and it's uh, it's fantastic. Actually, been really really impressed so far with with what it does. It's an app that you download on your smartphone, um, and it allows you to um, to drill straight down to um, some really important uh, data and information for for your child. So first of all, my letters will. Um, and other communications from the school will go there. Um, it's a cashless system as well, so paying for canteen meals, and school trips, all the rest of it can all be done through the app. Um, you can track your son and daughter's attendance and punctuality. Um, this year, the rewards and sanctions, the consequence points and the rewards points can be seen. Um, and that's a lovely um, way of parents um, having conversations with their sons and daughters in the afternoon. You can see which um, rewards they've been given that day and, and talk to them about why they were, you know, awarded that um, reward in geography in that lesson. And it's um, you know, some really nice conversations coming out of that for families to have. But likewise, a way for you to support us with poor behaviour if you see that a consequence point has been added for whatever reason. Um, so that's a really nice way of doing that. So, so that's really um, important for us as well. Um, tutor parent day I've mentioned parents evening I've mentioned um, you know again uh, um, one of the really nice things actually because it's new I talked about SLT senior leadership team being out on the gates every day uh, morning and afternoon um, actually we have some really great conversations um, there with with families and community members um, you know a, a bit more akin actually to, to primary schools and uh, you know uh, your jobs and your circumstances aside you know it's sometimes you know great if you can pop by then and you can you can tackle an awful lot there um, we've tried to make the area more welcoming for families with benches and um, plants and, and those sorts of things to make it a, a pleasant place for families um, it's currently the year seven uh, bubble who use the um, at the front of school there uh, but we welcome um, all of those things um, but you know, that's certainly a number of the ways in which you can keep in contact something we're always looking to improve I think it's something always secondary schools can do better so uh, we'll continue to evaluate what we do and hopefully improve it over the coming months and years Okay, um, question here about the gap between the Ofsted report and the actual educational grades from Azeem. Um, I would say there's no gap there, uh, I'm afraid, Azeem, between the Ofsted report. Obviously, uh, Ofsted came to visit just a uh, term and a half into my headship. Um, and it was fantastic that they um, saw Kelm Scott, two typical Kelm Scott days, January, cold, wet, all the rest of it, uh, but saw our students in a really fantastic light. Um, saw all the excellent work that we've done on behaviour that I've spoken about, um, on attendance, on punctuality, on exciting lessons, engagement, um, you know, and certainly all the data last year pre-lockdown um, showing our outcomes to be dramatically improved. Um, and I'm very confident, even with the disruption that we've had um, to uh, the education of the young people at Kelm Scott, I'm very confident that um, our outcomes will be positive this year and in future years as well. Um, and again, come back to my expectations. I've got the highest of expectations. And uh, sometimes those things take a bit of time, um, but I'm confident that you'll you'll see improved outcomes this summer. But um, what Ofsted said, um, I thought was a, was a fair reflection of, um, um, of what they saw on those two days. Thank you for that question, Azeem. Um, how much homework should children expect throughout their secondary school journey from Laura Lotz? Uh, no, um, I think uh, students are getting used to lots of homework, actually, aren't they, at, um, at primary school? Um, but it's no different at, at secondary school. I think, you know, broadly speaking, you're looking at um, three subjects a night in year seven, and about 30 minutes per homework. Um, so that gives you sort of a rough idea. That won't be every night, but most nights, I would say. And that is increasing all the way up into the GCSE years where... Again, you're probably looking to do um, two or three hours of homework a night. Um, again, I think our approach to homework um, is changing. I think uh, it's one of the really positive things to come out of lockdown and um, our use of Google Classroom to set, mark, monitor, give feedback to homework. has been one of the really exciting things that, that staff can engage with and it's something that here uh, to stay. But it's got to be purposeful homework. It's got to be targeted. Um, it doesn't have to be you know, 30 minutes every single time. It's just something that is directed that's important. But uh, now that's an important part of any teacher's planning um, as I mentioned, particularly at the moment, it's really important that uh, that purposeful homework is planned to try and uh, tackle those gaps in learning that we addressed um, on a previous um, question. And I think, again, coming back to the um, 
co-curricular opportunities as well. It's how what happens inside of the classroom, what happens outside of the classroom, that that, that experience comes together as a whole um, to hopefully um, equip um, young people with the uh, with the skills and knowledge they need for those individual subjects. Um, direct question from Kitty: How many art lessons will I have um, in year seven? It's two, but creative subjects are two per fortnight, I should say. Um, but actually, there'll be a further two um, creative subjects in terms of textiles, in terms of DT. Um, so, you know, it's something I talk about in my speech. We're a school that absolutely um, really values the arts uh, in particular. Um, and, you know, everything going there from art, art photography to creative and digital, the, the more media side, to textiles, um, to design technology, to music, to drama, um, you know, and across the board, it's something that's really, really important. And our options for, for our year nines when they're choosing their GCSEs, we encourage them to take a broadening subject, as we call it, so something that does give them that breadth. Um, and we really encourage them to choose, um, you know, a subject like the arts at that point as well. Um, and we also create some opportunities for our brightest students to still be able to do that by offering something called a session four. We've got three sessions I mentioned um, at the start. Uh, but we offer a fourth session to, to a small group of our students and that allows them to do uh, something like a triple science or something like a GCSE Latin outside of the traditional school day. And that means that they still get to do a broadening subject while still getting their English baccalaureate. So we've got some very clever and creative ways, actually, of ensuring that breadth of, um, of curriculum for, for all of our students. But um, we love the arts. You know, if you, if you came into school and one of the things we did uh, last summer was, uh, was celebrate our artists um, and all over every corridor. In fact, just outside my office here, there's a few examples of that is student artwork. Um, huge, big um, pieces of art that we've blown up and we've framed. Um, and it's all over our school uh, photography and um, you know, every every type of art, actually. Um, and it makes the school environment really bright, really vibrant, um, but also um, tells everybody, um, you know, what our feelings are, what our views are in art and really celebrates uh, the successes of our of our superb students so uh, yeah we, we love that and i hope you do too kitty um you know i think the variety actually in the art curriculum goes down to the to, to the skills and dispositions of that uh, department mask making um, they examine mythical creatures aboriginal art um islamic tile making um you know it's it's um it's great to, to go there and see all that um every single day uh, up there in the art department Okay, how are we doing for time? 21 minutes past six. Uh, hopefully you're still with me. How much of the art subjects focused on in the curriculum is the next question from Philippa. So hopefully we've covered that. Um, sports facility we have, uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, so what sports facilities do you have, do we use? And that's Laura and Diane asking those questions. Thank you both. Uh, we're really privileged and really fortunate there, um, pointing over there, because that's where the Leisure Centre is, but Walthamstow Leisure Centre is next door. Um, we have uh, exclusive use of those facilities from eight o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, a huge cavernous um, sports hall there, um, a big outside uh, multi-use games area. Uh, another small uh, size gym, as, as um, those of similar age to me will, will know it, a smaller kind of sports hall in a sense. Uh, and then our playgrounds too. So really fantastic uh, facilities. Um, we've just actually had some uh, a bid confirmed from the borough to resurface um, our main playground. Uh, so we've got an additional multi-use games area going up there that I'm hoping to organise in Kelmscott Blue. Um, which will be a really lovely surface. I think it's really going to lift the, um, the premises over at the back area of the school there. So, um, you know, that will be done this academic year. So hopefully it will be done before September. That's the plan. We start planning that after the October half term. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that. Um, we head down to um, Douglas Air um, down on Copper Mill Lane uh, for our sports day, a really uh, inclusive but exciting sports day down there too. Um, students love their, uh, their sport here, the P department, um, fantastic, um, both at developing expertise, but also encouraging sport for all and really instilling those excellent habits uh, in young people. Um, and if those habits are established young, um, the research says that um, that will continue with them into their, um, their later life. Okay. Um, music on the curriculum, um, one lesson a week at, at Key Stage 3, um, understanding music, there's the listening and contextual understanding, performing music, 
um, to kind of get to GCSE level, composing music. And it's taught by a dynamic music specialist, a real, um, another expert in his field. Um, and we, he joined us uh, 12 months ago, actually, and we've seen a real um, surge in uptake in, in music. Uh, also peripatetic uh, lessons taking place as well for those who want to pursue um, certain musical instruments. Um, that's something we we support as well and something we enable to happen. Um, so again, I think it hopefully was included in terms of uh, us prioritising the arts because music is a really important part of that. Okay, how do feel, uh, children feel about coming to Kelmscott? Really good question from Gareth. Um, I think um, if you spoke to students, they'd be really proud and really happy that they um, attend here. Uh, the one word that um, always comes through is safe. Um, it is an exceptionally safe environment um, here at school. And that's something, it's, as I said earlier, it's our number one priority is making sure that the students feel safe. Um, I hope they would say lots of challenges, lots of opportunities. And you know, I talk about those opportunities in my opening assembly um, each uh, year and again I think that's on the YouTube channel if you'd like to have a listen to that but it's grabbing those opportunities with both hands and there are so many at Kelm Scott um, and you know it, it's just about grabbing them and going for it and the students that do um, you know go on to amazing amazing things you know and I, I'm talking you know this year about the class of 2018 which was um, the group they were doing A-levels this summer and two of them, um, two of our alumni went off to Oxford um, this year to study history and maths. Um, you know, were two students who grabbed all the opportunities, particularly in those departments uh, for, for those two students because that was their love. Um, but um, yeah, lots and lots of challenges, lots of opportunities. Um, I hope that they feel valued, that they feel that their achievements and their efforts are um, appreciated. Coming back to those rewards versus consequences, that five to one rewards to consequences. Um, and I hope that every student feels valued there. When I talk about progress, it's not just about the high flyers here. Um, it's about how much progress you make. And that could be somebody trying to get the grade nines right at the very top end. But it could be somebody um, who's come to the country perhaps um, late in year 10 um, and is trying to achieve uh, some grade threes and fours whilst improving their, their spoken English. And you know, we're just as proud of, of those students sometimes because of the progress they've made as we are those students who have got there in terms of those eights and nines. Um, so I hope the students feel valued uh, as well. Okay, next question. Okay, what sets you apart from other secondary schools in Walthamstow? Okay, let's get to the crux of the matter, um, I suppose, uh, Melissa. And I, I think the first thing I'll say is that I, I feel fortunate to, to work in a, in a borough like uh, Walthamstow, and I work very closely with the other head teachers um, at Walthamstow. And, um, you know, we're, we're very lucky, the vast majority of that, all but one or two, I believe, are at least good schools. Um, so there's a great choice out there for you. Um, my advice on, um, you know, open evenings normally is to, come into a school and, and try and see and feel and hear what a school is about and I hope you've had an opportunity to do that through our virtual experience but as I say do come in and see us for these uh, distance visits um, if you're able to to try and feel that person if you haven't got that um, but I think we've got many um, unique selling points um, you know first of all I think when it comes down to our culture when it comes down to our ethos and you know you're seeing a little bit of that on the, on the posters uh, behind me last year's motto work hard be kind this year's motto, be strong, be cheerful, be brave, which I've spoken about in the speech. But, you know, we're a very kind and very caring school. Um, and that's something that's really, really important to me. And, you know, this one sums it up, work hard, be kind. And, you know, I want all of the staff and all of the students to be embodying that um, every single day um, if they can. So I think that really sets us apart and runs through us like, a, you know, that, that stick of rock. Um analogy um so, so that's really important i think um you know people are surprised to hear that we've got um, a full classics program um available to us and, and that's something you know we're one of the few state schools to to do that and offering latin um ancient greek uh, this year as well um, classic civilizations um all the way through uh gcc in fact one of the first uh, of our students um went on to oxbridge to, to study the classics and, and that's something that's that sets us apart um, I always, you know, talk about um, staff here at Kelmscott. We are a staff that are all on this journey together and all pull together and all have the same um, philosophy. On the recruiting, uh, the first thing we're looking to do is recruit nice human beings. 
then we're looking to recruit really um, expert practitioners, people who are excited about teaching and learning, people who are excited about improving their practice in the classroom. Um, so that's something that's, that's really important to us as well. Something I introduced last year was the business mentoring programme. We've got two wonderful partners, um, TransferWise, who are really um, dynamic uh, international um, tech brand, uh, tech company in uh, based in Shoreditch, um, and also 6KPW um, Barrister Chamber. Uh, one of our alumni, um, Mossin, uh, is a barrister, and we match our year 10 students um, with um, a mentor from one of those two places, and students kind of outside of COVID, um, meet up with their mentor uh, at least sort of once a month, once every six weeks. Sometimes the first few meetings take place in school. The next few meetings, a taxi picks students up from their home in the mornings, takes them into Shoreditch to, to uh, the workplace, and, and they have a, a meeting with a breakfast meeting at sort of half past seven, eight o'clock in the morning with their mentor, all down the barrister's chamber um, down in the city. Uh, and then back in time for, for their first lesson as well. Um, so that's something that uh, is really fantastic. Our springboard opportunities, I work with Royal Springboard, a charity, one of only three schools uh, in the country to work with them. Um, and that matches our students with some of the top boarding schools in the country. Um, I've spoken about that on my speech, but you know we're in constant contact with um, five of our alumni now. So one uh, the year before last and four this year, and they are thriving at those top, top schools. Uh, and it's our teaching in our classrooms that has allowed them to, to, to not just cope in those classrooms. They are excelling. Um, you know, Ida, who is in the first uh, year of Springboard, um, got 100% for her extended uh, project qualification um, that will contribute to her UCAS points this year. Um, Sayan, uh, another boy who's, who's down um, at the City of London Freeman School, got 100% for his maths test last week when I checked in and spoken to him. Um, it's his it's, Brilliant, it's great. Not doesn't surprise us. They're they're great, but it's great opportunities uh, for those guys as well. Um, I think our tutor reading program actually this year. So it's been lovely to focus on something really strategic this year. And every morning during registration, every student in school is read to by their form tutor. Really kind of aspirational books. Um, you know, year nine it might be something like Life of Pi. Year ten, Brick Lane. So kind of books that are, that are probably um, that are above uh, the student's chronological reading age um, but really exciting really engaging stories that they read and it's wonderful to see that happening and we think that by the time you know our year sevens this year have gone all the way through to year 11 with the tutor reading program they will have acquired somewhere between 60 and 80 thousand um, you know additional words they would have been exposed to and you know many of which they would have picked up of course um, so that's a really exciting um, program uh, as well. Um, I think our staff, as, as I've mentioned, but just to say that they are uh, con continuity with our staff. They they love working here. They, um, as I say, are on this journey with us, and um, you know, that continuity really helps us uh, as well. And I do come back to and sorry to bang on about it, but that holistic view of students. We we did like to develop the whole person working with the family to develop the whole person here, not just about those GCSE outcomes. Um, Melissa, I hope that answers your question. There's many more, by the way. I could go on, but we'll be here all night. Um, okay, summarise my core vision. Chris, I hope I've done that on the um, on my speech, but I think I've talked about just the everyday experience at, at, at Kelm Scott, um, enabling students to be equipped with the skills and dispositions they need to um, excel on a global stage. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, that's what the vision's about. I mean, there's so much that goes into that. Uh, but I hope I've given you a bit more um, flesh to those bones um, on my presentation on the Padlet page. So look at that if you haven't done already. Um, OK, is it possible to come and see your school for an open day? Um, I think this is the last question that I have a look at things. Um, so we're, we're about to wrap up. Um, Sylvia, thank you for that. Um, and I talked about that at the start. For those people who might be late joining um, uh, us tonight. Um, we thought long and hard about this, but it is possible is the uh, is the long and short of it. We've managed to create um, a meeting and a tour that, that keeps us completely outside of the building. Um, so so that way we, we are able to offer a really safe visit to school. And I, and I will do my utmost to, to clear my diary. I've cleared my diary as best I possibly can in the next two or three weeks to try and do as many of those visits myself. If not, Lucy Dalton, the deputy teacher, um, will be able to help. But I'm going to try and do all of those if I can myself. Um, so do give us a call, please, on the school number or email on the info at um, to get in contact if you'd like to organise one of those and, you know, any specific questions. But the tour that I've planned 
takes you through our, our new building. We've got a new uh, million pound uh, investment this year, uh, which is our new school canteen, which is being developed. That's because this time last year, uh, we were oversubscribed at year seven. We had a sixth form of entry, which was 180 students. But the borough realised that uh, we were, a school, well, not just the borough, but I think families and community realised we were a school on the journey and they've increased um, that to 210 for the, for the demand last year. But with that comes a brand new canteen um, and some redoing of classrooms, which is great. But the tour takes us through and allows you to look at the, the, the new build, which is quite exciting. But from the outside, um, doors to all our classrooms are open as part of our COVID response. Um, and we'll be able to look at some year seven learning. Uh, we'll also be able to look at some year 10 classes as well. And you'll be able to see us warts and all. And I'm always highly confident welcoming uh, families in or external visitors in to do that. And, you know, you can see if we walk the walk and I am, you know, highly confident that you'll be super impressed with what you see. So um, do get in contact, please, with that. Um, OK, I hope that you've kind of picked up from me sort of my enthusiasm for, for Kelm Scott as an institution. We are a true community school um, that, that serves our community and is proud to do so. Uh, we are on a really exciting journey. I, I say that a lot, but we are. Um, we'd love for you to be part of that. Um, you know, through all the things I've talked about, we end up with happy students with big smiles on their faces and the happy students go on to, to do great things um, in their exams and their later lives um, as well. Uh, and that gives them a strong exam profile too. Um, any questions or queries, any follow-up questions that you have from tonight, get in contact uh, in those two ways that I've described. Uh, don't be shy about that. There's a huge power in the partnership that, that we have with you at this school, with you as parents, and we're on this journey together. Um, working hand in hand um, to help develop your um, sons and daughters to be the very best version of themselves. And um, we'd be thrilled if you entrusted us uh, to provide that education uh, for your sons and daughters next year. Thank you so much for joining me and taking the time to be with us this evening. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in person, um, hopefully in the next few weeks. Can I wish all of you, uh, whatever your decision uh, in terms of placement for secondary school next year, the very best of luck. Um, with that decision, but also the very best of luck with the remainder of, of year six. Um, and uh, of course, during this uh, strange time that we find ourselves in the moment. Thank you very much, everybody.